Hello, and welcome to today's event, Confronting Russian Aggression, the Voices of Ukrainian Women. I'm Alain Brevere, the director of the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security. The crisis in Ukraine is at a critical moment with the unprecedented buildup of Russian troops, some 130,000, as well as offensive equipment, a buildup on the three sides of Ukraine. They are poised to attack because Ukraine's commitment to democracy and its aspirations to be integrated into Europe is unacceptable to the Russian president. Whether they will attack remains to be seen, but Ukraine has already paid a price and continues to pay a price. In 2014, Russian President Vladimir Putin annexed Crimea and went on to occupy the Donbass region in the east. For eight years, the Ukrainian people have been struggling against this ongoing aggression and the toll it has taken on their country. More than 13,000 lives have been lost and almost 2 million Ukrainians are internally displaced. They've also suffered from hybrid warfare, sustaining massive disinformation campaigns and cyber attacks, constant efforts to wear down the Ukrainian people, to destabilize and demoralize. Ukraine has a very strong civil society that was much in evidence during its revolution of dignity, a people striving for genuine democracy, integration with the West, government reform, and freedom. Its civil society continues to play a vital role. And in our discussion today, we will focus in considerable measure on civil society, Ukrainians on the front lines, women and men. Women leaders in government, in the security sector, in building trust across ethnic lines at the great grassroots level, and so much more have been demonstrating great commitment and expertise. Ukraine has a national action plan focused on the role of women in peace and security. It acknowledges the disparate impacts of conflict on women and men, and it calls for women's participation across government at all levels, including at the grassroots level. We will hear from some of the women leaders uh, and their calls for action to the international community. This discussion is very much about what is happening in Ukraine, but it is not only about Ukraine. It is about freedom, democracy, and the people's right to determine their own destiny. We are pleased to be joined by over 700 viewers on Zoom and more who are joining us on Facebook and we welcome each and every one of you. We have already received many pre-submitted questions from our audience members, and please know that you will also have the opportunity to submit questions to the speakers throughout the event. This event is being carried in English and Ukrainian. Please go to the bottom of your screen where it says language interpretation, and select the language you prefer. And also click mute original audio. I am now so pleased uh, to turn to Ambassador Bill Taylor, the former United States Ambassador to Ukraine, an exceptional leader who has long been committed to a secure, peaceful, and democratic Ukraine. He has held many important positions in government, has frequently testified before Congress, and currently serves as the Vice President for Russia and Europe at the United States Institute for Peace. Ambassador Taylor was just in Ukraine. With the delegation there, he met with President Zelensky and he met with others in government and civil society. Ambassador Taylor, welcome and thank you so much for being with us today. Along. We look we look forward very much, Bill, to your assessment of the situation in Ukraine as you see it at this critical moment. Um, what is at stake and why does civil society matter? Milan, 
first of all, <clears throat> thank you for the honor of joining you today. <clears throat> it, is, it is indeed an honor to join you, Buster Makarova, the other members of this, uh, uh, of this, of this event, uh, which, is, which is a true tribute to exactly the focus that is Ukrainian civil society, Ukrainian women, Ukrainian people who want independence. They want their freedom. They want their democracy. They want the right to be a normal European country. This is not so much to ask. And yet there's this threat that you just described. There's this threat to take that away. Um, and you're right, I was just in Ukraine last week um, and met with brave Ukrainians across, across civil society, across the government, um, who are ready to defend their country. So I am honored to be with you as you do this today. Um, uh, and I do believe that Mr. Putin, who forms this threat, who creates this threat, uh, who has created this crisis, has not yet decided what he's going to do. He is putting this, this military force in place, as you described, in order to intimidate President Zelensky or President Biden. Um, and President Zelensky, President Biden have not been intimidated. They have held firm to their principles. They have held firm to the principle that Ukrainians get to decide their fate. Ukrainians get to decide with whom they associate, with whom they, they, with whom they uh, get their security, with whom they trade, with who, who, the, who their leaders are. This is a Ukrainian's decision. This is not the decision for anyone else, certainly not, not for the Russians. When Mr. Putin looks at this problem, uh, he must see that if he invades, it will be terrible for, yes, Ukraine, but it will be terrible for Russia. It'll be terrible for Russia. Russian soldiers will die. Russian economy will be hammered by, by very harsh sanctions. There have been indications that the Russian people, the Russian citizens, are not supportive of this of this aggression, not supportive of this invasion. There could be destabilization in Russia um, uh, caused by this unpopular war against Ukraine. Most Russians have a good view, positive view uh, of Ukraine. Milan, this, this President Putin could be looking at at war crimes. Um, um, he he will clearly be looking at a very strong Ukrainian military. Uh, and a very strong and willing to fight Ukrainian civil society. So all of these should deter him, Milan. All of these should push him toward negotiation. And the West, the United States, NATO, Europe, we've all offered him this negotiation. If there are issues that he wants to address, we're ready to address them. We have issues to address. We have concerns about the Russian positions. Um, but there are ways to address those issues the way civilized nations do around the negotiating table, not, not invading their neighbor, not invading their neighbor. When I was in Ukraine last week, I did indeed uh, meet with President Zelensky, as well as a range of Ukrainians in and out of the government. President Zelensky was very happy with his relationship with the United States. Um, he also is expressing calm determination, resolve. As I mentioned earlier, he is not blinking. President Biden is with him and not blinking. President Zelensky mentioned several things that he's trying to do to prepare for uh, this challenge. One of the things he emphasized uh, is, and, and I will close soon on this, Milan, um, one of the things President Zelensky emphasized was the need for financing. As you mentioned, this has already had an effect, um, a bad effect uh, on Ukraine. You mentioned the 13, 14,000 Ukrainians who have already died from, from, the, from the invasion uh, that started in 2014 and is threatening to continue today in an even greater and greater extent. But the economic effects of this have also been, been in effect, have having this negative effect for all these years. And they, they, it's, all, it's having a bad effect right now. So. Um, the United States um, and the international community, and in particular the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, um, ought to be taking a look at measures that we can take collectively 
to help Ukraine weather this financial storm, as just like we are helping them weather this military challenge. And to uh, wind up here and uh, hand it off to Ambassador Markarva, there could be no better ambassador to the United States right now than Ambassador Oksana Markarva, who, when I was um, in Ukraine most recently, was the extraordinary Minister of Finance. Um, and now she's the extraordinary ambassador here and couldn't be here at a better time. So I am very pleased, Milan, to be able to, to listen to Ambassador Markarva. And again, it's an honor uh, to be here with you today. And I wish this, this event great success. Thank you so much, Ambassador Taylor. And we can only hope uh, that President Putin will be deterred uh, and that Ukraine can go on as it has aspired to. Thank you so much. And Ambassador Markova, Markovina, it is a, a real pleasure to have you with us. Um, Ambassador Taylor has already introduced you, so I don't need to do that. He mentioned the importance of economic issues and finance. Uh, you have, as he mentioned, a, a big background in uh, this area, having been uh, the Minister of Finance previously. Uh, so we're eager to hear from you, uh, to hear your assessment of the situation in Ukraine today, uh, as well as the position of your government uh, and the importance of civil society. So, uh, Oksana Markarova, welcome, Ambassador Markarova. Well, good morning to everyone from Washington, D.C. I know the time is different from for, for the, our audience, at least for big part of our audience, but here we're just starting yet another day in this really challenging uh, times. Uh, first of all, thank you uh, both Ambassador Vervira and Ambassador Taylor for kind words about uh, me. I'm, I'm honored to represent my country in Washington DC in the United States and I'm honored to work with exceptional people like you here uh, because we are doing this together and Right now, the situation is really on the first pages of all the newspapers and TV stations. But I would like to start with reminding everyone that this situation did not start today. In 2014, Ukraine has been attacked. Crimea has been illegally occupied or annexed, as Russia would say. Uh, and parts of Donetsk and Lugansk Oblast still remain occupied. Our people are being held in prison. Uh, the prosecution of uh, Ukrainian citizens, Crimean Tatars, Ukrainians, people of different nationalities is ongoing. We have 475 people that we know that are illegally imprisoned and those lists we are submitting to everyone here and asking for any support in order to get our people back. So this is something, and in addition to this military attacks, as both of you rightfully said, for the past eight years, we are living in a situation when the hybrid attacks, disinformation, cyber, all type of attacks on uh, many reform governments and others have been ongoing. Uh, all of these have only one goal, undermine the transition of Ukraine into what we have decided we want to be, European democratic people where not all Ukrainians actually participate in the wealth of the country and all Ukrainians decide how we want to live and who we want to be. Now, this is not something new for us. It didn't start even eight years ago. For the past couple of hundred uh, years, Ukraine has been struggling to regain its independence, territorial integrity, and to become independent country. And we had a very short time of that independence in the, uh, in 1918, when together with many European countries, we were able to gain our independence, proclaim independence. In 2018, during only one year, we had our own currency, bank, uh, land code, labor code. Uh, in, in 1919, just recently, we have been celebrating 103 years of the unification of Central and Western Ukraine into one country. So we've had it and we were attacked and we were occupied by then uh, Soviet Union or uh, predecessors pre, pre of the Soviet Union. But regardless of how you call it, Russian Empire, Soviet Union, Russian Federation, 
we face the same threat over and over for only one reason, because over and over Ukrainians are making this civilizational choice that we want to be who we have always been. We want to be European. We want to be free and democratic. And this is one of the values which we share with uh, the United States, you know, here, I think, you know, this is one of the most visible common traits that we have with American people, that not only we love freedom, not only we have the respect and love for democracy, but we're also willing to fight for it. Now, right now in this situation, when we have uh, different calculations, uh, depending on what difference do you count, what, what distance do you count from our border, uh, but we have definitely over 100,000 new additional troops and equipment. It can be 120 or 130, depending on uh, what distance from the border do you take, of the Russian army uh, on our eastern border, in the Crimea, which is occupied by Russia, illegally occupied, and in Belarus. And we have this uh, new, starting from the famous uh, article by Mr. Putin, the new level of informational also pressure on Ukraine. Uh, what are we doing in order to not panic, stay resilient and stay strong and uh, make sure that we will not only uh, panic under this threat, but also will uh, remain independent and remain on our path to democracy and our Euro-Atlantic integration. Together with our partners, and you have heard from Ambassador Taylor, but I think we do have unprecedented level of support and unprecedented level of cooperation with pretty much all of our partners who value democracy, but with the United States especially. I mean, this year started with, uh, uh, not this year, last year, 2021, started with increased number of contacts and visits and uh, uh, and President Zelensky visited President Biden on his uh, invitation, uh, only second European leader who was in the White House. And we not only signed the joint statement during the visit, but very quick after that, we renewed our strategic partnership charter. We have uh, uh, started our, our um, uh, trade and investment commission. We are working on the energy dialogue. So the cooperation on all fronts is very active. Now, for the first time, we have signed uh, in last September the framework agreement on defense. And this is a solid basis for what you all see now, the increased cooperation in strengthening our defense capabilities now. And this is what we are focusing on. I mean, let me be very clear, Ukrainians are peaceful. Even though Crimea is Ukraine, even though Donetsk and Lugansk are illegally occupied, we do not plan any offensives. We prefer the diplomatic solution and we're working day and night, all diplomats, and I'm honored to be a small part of uh, this large diplomatic uh, uh, force that is working day and night in order to still use the diplomatic solution in order to restore peace in throughout Ukraine and regain our territories back. At the same time, right now in the face of this uh, threat, we are also working on three levels of deterrence, the political deterrence. And that's why, and I think that's where we, all the diplomatic team and President Zelensky have been very successful. Uh, Minister Kuleba just today uh, in his daily briefing that he gives to the press mentioned that every week we have high level visitors <clears throat> from all of our partners and friends of the highest level. Uh, tomorrow we will have President Macron in, uh, in Kiev, today we have a number of foreign ministers and it happens on a daily basis now. So we are getting the word out, not only the words out, but we also are forming this new alliances, many regional alliances in order to show that we stand together. The second part is very important is the economic deterrence. And it's not only a comprehensive package of sanctions, which we are very happy how it's evolving it's, we started at a place when Ukraine has been saying that we need more sanctions, that sanctions should be wider, that sanctions should be now because Putin already attacked Ukraine. Putin already is illegally uh, holding some of the territories. And now I think we are uh, in, in, a, in a place where we 
work together with our friends, not convincing our friends, but working together with our friends on what the sanctions could be. But very important part of that, again, as Ambassador Taylor already mentioned, is not only deterring Russia and sanctioning Russia, but also helping us to maintain stable at this threat. Because again, this hybrid aggression and this threat is not only to threaten us militarily, but also to pressure all our international uh, partners and also all investors and businesses away from Ukraine, which again, should not happen. We will resist, we will successfully resist, and uh, as we used to say during the past eight years, even though we had war and our uh, very capable military has been defending us on the fronts, 95% of Ukraine is open for business. And actually the more uh, compliant Western business we will have in Ukraine, the less is the possibility for anyone to attack Ukraine. So this, this has been a very important part of it. And of course, the third deterrence is defensive military capabilities. And you see now on a daily basis, new flights coming from the United States from the recent package authorized by President Biden in December. Uh, uh, he has taken this uh, uh, decision very quickly. It was very timely and very, very appreciated in Ukraine. So now we will have much stronger capabilities. Now, I would like to finish my, my, my remarks with saying that um, we would like to thank all of, the, all of our international partners, uh, to President Biden personally, uh, being a leader of not only uh, the support, big support group here in the United States, but also uh, reaching out to all the uh, to all the de democratic countries of the world, essentially, and raising this issue that it's not only about Ukraine. It's not only to support us to preserve our independence in this century and uh, to allow Ukrainians to be who we want to be. It's also about whether you can actually make this choice to be a democratic country, to be an independent country, and not to be attacked right after that by the autocratic regime. So I, I think the implications of this uh, Russia crisis uh, that they're creating around the uh, Ukrainian border is much larger. Uh, and it's not only about peaceful and secure Ukraine, it's about peaceful and secure uh, Europe, but also ultimately it's also about whether the international law, a rule of law, international rule of law uh, is still something that we all can rely on. Uh, in order to, uh, to, to know that every country actually can feel uh, secure within its borders. Now, it's very important that we are meeting today and we are discussing this issue with the angle of the civil society and especially women participating in it. When I was the Minister of Finance, uh, I'm very uh, proud that I was able with my team to implement the gender-oriented budgeting, which actually is very important and it generates, generates results. Uh, and I think women in Ukraine, but women um, everywhere is such an important force that the more we participate uh, in uh, all, all levels of government, uh, business, but also in peace uh, regulations is, is, is very important and provides additional, additional uh, uh, value, not only to women, but to every country where we participate more. So I would like to close my remarks with a quote by another well-respected uh, uh, woman, Ambassador Madeleine Albright, who said, it took me a, a long time to develop a voice. And now that I have it, I will not, I'm not going to be silent. And I think that we can say not only about Ukrainian women, but also about all Ukrainians. After we regained our voice, our, we gained our voice, our, we gained our independence, we will not be silent and we will not be intimidated. So I would like to wish all of us a good conversation today, look forward to it. And uh, thank you for all the support uh, in the United States, but also in Ukraine from everyone who are with us today in this very important fight. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Makarova. And your voice has been a critical voice at this time. And I agree with 
Ambassador Taylor, who said that Ukraine could not possibly have a better ambassador in the United States uh, at this uh, critical moment. Uh, so thank you for being with us. Thank you for setting the context for this discussion as we now go forward and hear from our other uh, participants. Uh, and we wish you well uh, in the critical days ahead. Uh, we're going to turn now to those voices of women that uh, the ambassador just mentioned. Uh, a few women who are at the front line or near the front line uh, in Ukraine. Uh, you will hear briefly from them. One is an internally displaced woman driven out of Luhansk, which is currently occupied, and others are from Kramatorsk, from Mariupol, and from Kharkiv. Can we please hear from them now? Майже вісім років тому разом зі своєю сім'єю я була вимушена покинути домівку через вторгнення Росії. Саме так проявляється дружба сусідньої України. Я постраждала від війни, але я не є жертвою. Сьогодні я правозахисниця, відстою цінності демократії і свободи. Я не сама у цій царині. Я маю підтримку інших жінок-миротворець. Ми об'єднуємося коаліції та платформи. Ми посилюємо одна одну і робимо все для того, щоб життя у наших громадах було безпечним, для того, щоб ми були стійкими до зовнішніх загроз. Резолюція 1325 – це інструмент, який дає змогу побачити різний вплив війни на жінок, чоловіків, хлопців та дівчат. Вона дає змогу дбати про безпеку жінок і включати їх у прийняття рішень. Я вірю у силу жінок і в Україну. Мене звуть Лілія Кисліцина, я із міста Краматорська, Донеччина, Україна. Я хочу привітати цей почесний форум від українських жінок, які живуть сьогодні на Донеччині, які живуть уже дев'ятий рік біля війни. І хочу сказати, що ми всі різні, ми говоримо на різних мовах. Ми співаємо, можемо співати і різні пісні, бо у нас є і ромки, і гречанки, і українки, і росіянки. Дуже багато національностей, які живуть на Донеччині. Але ніхто і ніколи нас не притісняв і за нашою мовою, і за нашою культурою, і за наших традицій. І ті події, які почали відбуватися у 2014 році на Донеччині, це той проєкт, який принесла Росія до нас сюди, на Донеччину, сказавши, що у нас іде внутрішня війна. Немає у нас ніякої війни. Ми хочемо жити, ми хочемо будувати і хочемо продовжувати наші процеси до євроінтеграції. Сьогодні жінкам Донеччині дуже важко. Ми кожен день знаємо, що таке смерть. Що таке, коли розділили дві території і коли твої батьки залишились на окупованій території, а ти сидиш на неокупованій, а їм вже по 60, по 70, по 80. Ми знаємо, що таке, коли ти живеш в определенній неопределенності і так уже 9 рік. І ми бачимо в резолюції 1325 той інструмент, який обов'язково жінкам Донеччини дозволить вибороти мир і повернути свої території, які сьогодні окуповані. Я хочу звернутися завдяки цьому заходу до Росії, до президента Росії. Перестаньте нас вбивати. Дайте нам жити і дайте жити нашим дітям. Ідіть і будуйте мир на своїй території. А ми в Україні розберемося з нашою політикою самі. Марина Погачова, правозахисниця та голова громадської організації «Маріупольська асоціація жінок Берегіня». Ми працюємо по лінії розмежування з 2015 року. Ми працюємо з жінками-переселенками з 2015 року. За ці роки ми стали близькими людьми які пережили дуже багато всього і гарного, і не дуже гарного. Чи бояться ці жінки сьогодні агресивних дій з боку сусіда? Так, звичайно, бояться. Чи бояться ці жінки за себе та своїх близьких? Так, звичайно, бояться. 
Чи бояться вони, що знов поновиться ситуація, що треба буде сидіти в подвалах і ховати своїх дітей в подвалах? Бояться. Але це не паніка. Хоча жінки бояться, знаєте, як то кажуть, голова боїться, а руки роблять. Наші жінки разом з нашою організацією роблять дуже багато гарних речей. Це комунікаційні клуби, це допомога літнім людям та дітям, це боротьба за свої права і активна позиція в своїх громадах. Більше п'яти населених пунктів тепер мають жіночі вільні простори. Більше десяти населених пунктів мають свої організації, жіночі організації, які працюють на благо своїх громад. Я Ярина Чаговець, голова благодійної організації «Сестра Милосердя», а також голова правління Українського об'єднання учасників бойових дій та волонтерів АТО у Харківській області. Ми живемо на Харківщині і принаймні знаємо дві мови – українську і русський язик, на котором я, між прочим, проговорила більшу частину своєї життя. Було все спокійно, і ніхто нікого ніколи не притиснював. Але це було тільки до 2014 року. У 2014 році Росія вирішила, що треба спасати людей, які говорять на русському язикі, хоча ніякої проблеми в тому, що ми говоримо українською, а вони говорили на русському, ніколи не було. Росія розв'язала війну в Україні. У 2014 році жінки, дівчата і старші жінки всі стали на захист Батьківщини. Хтось взяв зброю і вступив до лап Збройних сил України, а хтось допомагав саме по волонтерській лінії. Ми всі вмісті, хоч і говоримо на русском і українском, але ми одна єдина Україна. Нас не треба спасати. Ми співіснуємо. Разом. Разом і до кінця. До перемоги. Слава Україні! Ми дуже вдячні чути від жінок в Істерній Україні і чути їх сказати, що не важливо, що відбувається, вони продовжують працювати гарно, щоб привезти свою країну до того, де вони всі працюють, щоб привезти її, навіть до кількості відбувається до них. We now turn to Katarina Levchenko, the government commissioner for gender equality. She was appointed by the Ukrainian cabinet of ministers and coordinates gender policy across the ministries. Among her responsibilities is overseeing the implementation of Security Council Resolution 1325 on women, peace and security. Her office is situated in the office of the deputy prime minister of Ukraine for European and Euro-Atlantic integration. Earlier, she served as a member of parliament and represented Ukraine in the OSCE East Parliamentary Assembly. She's authored legislation on many important issues like domestic violence prevention, and has also served as the president of the International Women's Rights Center, La Strada, for more than two decades. Uh, we are so grateful to have you with us, Katarina. Grateful for all the work you do uh, in your country. Uh, perhaps you can give us a, a brief sense of how the Ukraine's National Action Plan on Women, Peace and Security is being implemented in the current crisis um, and the key role women are playing. Uh, and any words of advice, uh, recommendations you may have to the international community. Welcome. Thank you, Milan. Uh, thank you very much for organizing this important event. And it's really a very uh, good opportunity to hear voice of Ukrainian women and to um, assist Ukraine in uh, combating with uh, Russian um, aggression and Russian uh, occupation. And um, thank you so much for your solidarity with uh, Ukrainian people and uh, for standing with us. And um, despite of uh, a number of diplomatic contacts 
and political statements uh, made over the past few weeks, we see that Russia continues its military build up uh, along the border with Ukraine. And uh, therefore, we really need to do everything possible to prevent this aggression. According to the analytical estimations, invasions can cause a migration crisis as there uh, will be up to 5 million of Ukrainian refugees in Europe, among which two-third will be women and children. And now I can compare the situation uh, with Russian invasion with the current situation in Afghanistan. Afghanistan is a clear example of how women's rights are violated. And Ukraine's government and Ukrainian women uh, are standing with the Afghan women. In August 2021, Ukraine evacuated around 500 Afghan refugees, including Sahra Karimi, an Afghan film director, producer, and first female chairperson of the Afghan film organization. And therefore, women's peace and security agenda is relevant as never before in Ukraine, in all regions of Central and Eastern Europe, and maybe all Europe and even globally. And I also would like uh, to ensure you that uh, it is one of the key priorities for Ukrainian government. Second National Action Plan, which uh, has been adopted by Ukrainian government last year, includes several areas of responsibility for state institutions on women, equal participation in the peace and security agenda. This is strategic goal number three as well as monitoring and advancement of the national security situation through the gender lens. It's a strategic goal number two. Uh, Vice Prime Minister of Ukraine on European and Euro Atlantic integration, Pani uh, uh, Olga Stefanishina, coordinates the implementation of this plan as an integrated part of whole policy on achieving gender equality in all spheres of uh, life of society. And we use diff she used this different platform for such coordinations, including commission on ensuring equal rights and equal opportunities for um, women and men, and uh, spectral working group, gender equality within the donor coordination architect. And we are, would like, I would like to inform you that uh, the latest meeting of such sectoral working groups um, was uh, on last Friday. And this meeting was focusing uh, on the new Women, Peace and Security uh, program and projects in Ukraine in terms of strengthening and synergy between the government, development partners, international organizations, and civil society, first of all, women and feministic organizations, including Ukrainian Women Fund, including uh, like UN Women uh, in Ukraine, uh, EU Advisory Mission in Ukraine, and other partners for, from the uh, international community and uh, non governmental organizations. However, there is a need for further concentrate actions to support uh, the integration of gender equality at the heart of peace and security in Ukraine. In a time of a complicated security situation and COVID-19 pandemic uh, to ensure women's full and equal participation in all relevant projects, including decision-making. And we will uh, greatly appreciate the partner's support with implementation of National um, Action Plan on 1325. In particular, with strategic goal two of this National Action Plan on designing a gender responsive system for identifying and uh, responding to security challenges and conducting uh, women, peace and security training to increase the conceptual understanding of human security 
as a very wide phenomenon and how gender roles should be considered in a multi-faceted response to security issues in times of peace and Russian aggression. At the end of my uh, speech, I want to suggest um, as my recommendation to prepare and publish as a result uh, of uh, our discussion, the joint statement on how current external security threats affect women in Ukraine. I think it will be very important steps which really gives will give opportunity for, to Ukrainian women voices to be heard uh, throughout the world. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I really appreciate very much to work together with uh, all partners, with you, Milan, with your institute. And thank you one more time for uh, this full support, which we really uh, have from you in Ukraine. Well, thank you so much, Katerina. And we value your ongoing leadership and I uh, hope that we can continue this cooperation, particularly uh, in this critical time uh, and uh, accentuating as you have the importance of the role of women uh, in Ukraine. We're gonna now turn to another Katerina, to Katerina Pavlichenko, the Deputy Minister for Internal Affairs of Ukraine. In her position, uh, the minister is responsible for gender policy implementation particularly in combating and prevention of domestic violence and human rights monitoring. She earlier served as the deputy chief of the uh, patrol police and the national police of Ukraine. And prior to joining a law enforcement, she has had a career um, in legal affairs. Uh, Minister Pavlichenko, welcome. We are so pleased to have you with us again as well. Uh, in your position in government, uh, you've been involved in Ukraine's efforts to prepare for and respond uh, to continuing Russian aggression uh, through oversight of the National Guard, the border police and local police. Uh, and you've been successful in implementing gender policy in the work of the ministry, uh, including women's participation in law enforcement. Uh, tell us why that participation uh, is so critical in this current crisis uh, and what you've been hearing from your colleagues in Eastern Ukraine, uh, where the war has been going on for many years now. What role are women playing and what recommendations do you have to all of us? Minister Pavlichenko. Доброго дня, шановні учасники і учасниці сьогоднішньої віртуальної події. Ну, перш за все, я би хотіла відмітити, що роль жінок важлива у всіх процесах, що відбуваються сьогодні, зокрема в секторі безпеки. І щоденно, працюючи над порядком денним резолюції ООН 1325 «Жінки мир безпека», ми, Міністерство внутрішніх справ, орієнтовано а, на те, щоб посилити участь жінок у процесі прийняття рішень, те вже про що сьогодні а, говорили, а також а, забезпечення комфортних умов несення служби жінками, які вже, несуть, а, які вже працюють в правоохоронних органах, а, і а, надати можливості поєднання як сімейних, так і професійних обов'язків. Резолюція насправді дійсно є важливим кроком для визнання непропорційного впливу війни на жінок, а також важливості участі жінок у попередженні конфліктів і розбудові миру. Показником гендерної рівності в сфері безпеки України і дійсно актуальним питанням в умовах збройної агресії Росії проти України є залучення жінок до правоохоронної і миротворчої діяльності. Ми розуміємо, що безпека сьогодні є, не є питання виключно чоловічим. І це доведено дійсно і світовою спільнотою, оскільки жінки, які долучені до розв'язання конфліктів, вони демонструють неабиякі результати в процесах розбудови миру, зокрема, стають дійсно інколи такою точкою для примирення. 
Останнім часом, навіть якщо ми будемо говорити з того моменту, коли в Міністерстві внутрішніх справ відкрилися посади, які ще до 2017 року були заборонені для жінок в секторі безпеки і оборони, то сьогодні ми говоримо, що ми зазнали суттєвих змін в питаннях забезпечення гендерної рівності, в питаннях рівних прав та можливостей для жінок і чоловіків. Ми розуміємо, що залучення жінок до роботи в правоохоронних органах на всіх рівнях сприяє, перш за все, також зростанню і рівня довіри і справедливості з боку населення, з боку громади і з боку суспільства загалом. Це також дозволяє зробити більш видимою роль жінок у побудові сталого миру і безпеки. Сьогодні ми відслідковуємо позитивну динаміку на посадах, як на керівних посадах, так і на посадах офіцерських. Відслідковуємо позитивну динаміку збільшення кількості жінок на таких посадах. І е, варто відмітити, що в Міністерстві внутрішніх справ відсоток е, жінок на керівних посадах на сьогоднішній день становить 34%. Е, і наразі кожна третя жінка в апараті Міністерства внутрішніх справ е, перебуває на керівній посаді. В прикордонній службі відсоток жінок-офіцерів становить 19%, що на 7% більше в порівнянні, наприклад, з попередніми періодами, якщо ми беремо, там, починаючи з 2016 року. В Національній гвардії на сьогоднішній день нараховується 10% жінок-офіцерів. І 8 перебувають на керівних посадах в підрозділах Національної гвардії. Тому ми говоримо про те, що е, жінки все частіше все ж таки е, долучаються і до е, підрозділів в правоохоронних структурах з Міністерства внутрішніх справ, і до керівних рішень, а отже, до, е, і до керівних посад, а отже, до прийняття відповідних рішень. Ми розуміємо, що е, професійні успіхи жінок в секторі безпеки і оборони також вони мають залежати не виключно, не можуть залежати від рівня їх мускулінності, а вони мають також відповідати якості професійних навичок і здібностей. Тому дуже багато зусиль ми покладаємо на проведення різних тренінгів, навчань, які відбувалися минулого тижня і цього тижня також проводяться Міністерством внутрішніх справ, залучаючи різні підрозділи. Міністерство внутрішніх справ орієнтується е, також е, не тільки на збільшення кількості жінок в правоохоронних е, структурах, а також і на посиленні, на дотриманні їх е, прав. Е, ми напрацьовуємо внутрішні політики, процедури і практики і вносимо відповідні зміни до наших внутрішніх нормативно-правових документів, якими, зокрема, затверджується порядок проведення службових розслідувань за фактами дискримінації та сексуальних домагань на робочому місці. Також хотіла би відмітити в рамках сьогоднішнього виступу, що одним із нововведень в українському законодавстві є норма, яка передбачає притягнення військовослужбовців і поліцейських до адміністративної відповідальності за домашнє насильство на загальних підставах, а не в рамках дисциплінарного статуту. Вважаємо, що імплементація такого досвіду дійсно підвищує рівень привабливості служби правоохоронних органів для жінок, і для чоловіків, а також забезпечує пріоритетний принцип роботи Міністерства внутрішніх справ. Безпека має бути для всіх і кожного. Також, прийнявши відповідний закон, варто відмітити, що наша держава, Україна, дійсно вкотре продемонструвала готовність діяти в напрямку забезпечення невідворотності покарання для кривника – і захисту постраждалої від домашнього насильства, насильства за ознакою статі. Ну і на сам кінець свого виступу я хочу сказати, що е, сьогодні правоохоронці системи Міністерства внутрішніх справ, незалежно від статі, е, дійсно готові протистояти будь-яким загрозам і захищати населення від будь-яких порушень їх прав. Е, тому хочу подякувати сьогодні, щиро подякувати всій європейській світовій спільноті, за виявлений інтерес, за ту підтримку, яку ми сьогодні маємо і відчуваємо. І ми дійсно будемо раді в подальшому співпрацювати та обмінюватися досвідом стосовно питань дієвих, напрацювання дієвих механізмів 
реагування на випадки, на випадки дискримінації, сексуальних домагань на робочому місці, гендерно-зумовленого насильства та домашнього насильства. Дякую. Well, thank you so much, uh, Deputy Minister Pavlochenko, and uh, for your hard work and leadership in this uh, important uh, area. We now uh, are going to hear from two leaders in civil society, having heard from uh, women in government. I'm going to turn first uh, to Natalia Karborska, who is a fierce advocate for women's empowerment and gender equality. She currently serves as the Director for Strategic Development of the Ukraine Women's Fund and earlier served as chair of its board for many years, building and supporting uh, strong alliances with the grassroots and national organizations across Ukraine. Uh, she serves on the Gender Advisory Council of the Ministry of Social Development, uh, Social Policy of Ukraine, and earlier still, uh, served as director of women's economic programs with Winrock uh, and the women's program director in Ukraine of Open Society Institute. Natalia, thank you so much uh, for all that you do. I know of your hard work over many years. Um, please tell us why the women, peace and security agenda is critically important uh, to Ukraine right now. And perhaps you can talk a little bit about the impacts of war on women and women's solutions-based uh, actions. Uh, what are you hearing on uh, women's uh, security concerns at this time? Natalia, please. Thank you, Ambassador Verbeer. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in such an important event. Uh, um, when I, when I uh, listened to the voices of uh, Ukrainian women from the East, I was thinking about my mother. She's 86 and, and she does remember the Second World War. She was five when the war started in Ukraine. Her mother and her brother were killed during the bombing of Kyiv, but she survived and spent three years in, in the orphanage. I was also thinking while listening to the stories, I was thinking about my daughter who asks me what she shall say to her three years old son my grandson, if he asks why they have to hide from shooting in Kyiv. I was also thinking about millions of women in different parts of the country. Uh, these are the women that my organization, Ukrainian Women's Fund, work with. Uh, they are the majority of internally displaced people who had to flee from their homes in uh, 2014 and 2015. They are those who suffer from economic consequences of war and COVID pandemic. Uh, we spoke about uh, economic uh, today um, and in Ukraine, especially in the East, many, uh, many women are breadwinners in their families. There are many women entrepreneurs. They are mostly self-employed, run micro businesses and during crises, their businesses are suffering a lot and might suffer even more. Women, this is what we hear from them, they might suffer even more in case of escalation because the social infrastructure, for example, services for domestic violence survivors, is not strong yet to adapt to changes. Uh, another important thing that you could get concern of Ukrainian women is that we are st still not at the tables where decision are made, decisions are made. Uh, and this is extremely important because as Ambassador Sir said, women's equality is critical to national security. Despite quotas, overall we have, um, after the recent uh, local elections, we have 12.6 less women in local councils. And this is mostly due to the 36% decrease in the number of women in amalgamated communities councils as a result of the last elections. Ukrainian Women's Fund works with women's rights organizations that represent and support all these women. These organizations are still underfunded. They are burned out. All these years, they have to respond to humanitarian needs and don't have time 
and resources to work on changing the policies. We also, while preparing to this conversation, I spoke to many of our partners in the regions and asked them about recommendations for the international community. So they said that it is very important to continue pressure on Russia. It is extremely important to engage other international partners to make this pressure stronger. It is very important to support women's rights organizations and women activists. They are the voice of women at the local and other levels in Ukraine. Also equally important is to provide support to civil society and women's rights organizations, not only in the Eastern parts of the country, but also in the North at the border with Belarus, in the South at the border with temporary occupied Ukrainian Crimea, in the center and in the West. Because many women, many families in Ukraine say now that if Russia invades further, the only way for them will be to flee to the West, to the border with NATO. Uh, also, when I listened to the voices of women, I recalled my own experience and my own story. I spoke at the uh, international conference back in 2015 or 2016 uh, uh, when it was the beginning of Russian aggression and there was also, I also heard the comment from the audience about Russians, saving Russian speaking population. Um, it was six years ago and unfortunately nothing changed, the same rhetoric. I said that I'm, uh, that I'm, I'm Russian speaking population. I grew up in a Russian speaking family and speak Russian with them, but I don't want Russians to come to my country and save me. I want to live in my Ukraine where my family and I feel absolutely comfortable speaking no matter what language, Russian or Ukrainian. Um, I want to ask all those who care about Ukraine, about democracy and peace in Europe. I want to ask that we all need to be louder. We all need to be more persistent and we need to push harder. We in Ukraine need the support of international community in building our independent democratic country for us, for our parents and for our children. If the world gives up on Ukraine, the consequences will be terrible, not only for us. As Ambassador Fergir, you said at the beginning, it's not only about Ukraine. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Natalia. Thank you for those very clear recommendations for the call to action for all of us. Uh, and like so many, I know of your extraordinary efforts over many, many years. Uh, so continue to do all that you are doing. We're going to turn now to Elena Suslova, who's a human rights activist and founder of the Women's Information Consultative Center uh, in Ukraine. Elena has more than 20 years of experience there, uh, as well as abroad, uh, working on issues like peacekeeping, transformation of conflicts, CETA implementation and monitoring. She has served as a member of the Advisory Council of the Parliament Committee on Human Rights, and she's well known throughout civil society uh, in Ukraine and has published more than 50 books, research articles, and manuals on critical issues. Uh, Elena, you have long advocated for a comprehensive understanding of security. What does that mean for women in Ukraine? Uh, and why is a comprehensive approach to security especially important at this time? Elena. Thank you, Melan. Thank you for this event. Thank you for the attention to Ukraine all these hard years. During the war, we became more mobilized and more sensitive. Mobilization allowed us to gather our souls in a shorter time and start practical action. Sensitivity does not leave the attention and the slightest fluctuations on the part of the aggressor. Therefore, uh, brandishing weapons near our borders requires both practical actions to strengthen, to strengthen the defense capability and attention to the fact that security is not just, just stop fire. The feeling of security has many components. One of the important needs identified by us 
uh, in the process of the study, a conversation with women and, and security conducted in 2020 is the need for emotional security. Feeling I'm safe, we are safe. Emotional security not included in the classification recommended by the UNDP. However, it is so important for human security in general, especially today, because hybrid war and other attacks, which often aim to uh, disrupt emotional security. And it is important for the emotional security of women and men that the state not only checks the combat readiness of the security and defense sector, however, also informs citizens how to act in crisis situation in the case of disappearance of mobile communication, uh, what to do to parents if the crisis situation catches them at work and children are in kindergartens and schools, what to do to pregnant women and the line of division where there are no medical and obstetric points and many other issues. An entire chapter of the second action plan 1325 in Ukraine is devoted to these issues because efforts of the civil society. We hope the government will pay more attention to the monitoring of this chapter, as well as the international classification will be changed too. It seems to me that uh, such a strong and prestigious organization as the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security can initiate a broad high level discussion on this issue, bringing more attention, including it in international classification. We are ready to share the Ukrainian experience. To be more successful in promotion the comprehensive approach to security, we can if more women will make decision on this approach. We lack women in track one, two of any negotiation and we lack efforts on the expansion of this staff reserve. 2016, I took part in the course on negotiations for women, both governmental officials and civil society activists from Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine. It was been organized by the UN Women and the Klingendale, the Netherlands Institute of International Relations, an independent think tank and academy on international affairs based in the Hague. It was very useful. However, there are, were only six of us. I think such programs could be multiplied. At the end, I wish all of us to meet all the troubles of our turbulent times in a mobilized and sensitive way. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Elena. And thank you for raising the ongoing uh, challenges of uh, women whose perspectives are so critical, who work uh, in track two or track three level negotiations and dialoguing, uh, and that rarely gets into the official channels, how important it is to close uh, that gap. Uh, and uh, so many of the other critical ways of participation uh, that you mentioned and that you continue to work on. Uh, so thank you for that and for your ongoing work. Uh, before we turn to our participants who have tuned in from literally over 100 countries uh, for the question and answer period, uh, we're going to uh, turn to our final speaker uh, to bring her perspective uh, to this discussion, to the very respected ambassador of Canada to Ukraine. Her Excellency Larissa Galadza has been Canada's ambassador to Kiev since 2019. She brings great strengths uh, and experience to her position, so much more at this urgent moment. She previously served as Canada's Director General of the Peace and Stabilization Operations Program at Global Affairs Canada, where she directed the implementation of Canada's commitments to UN peace operations, as well as Canadian police arrangement. She has had a long career spanning policy areas from defense and social development to immigration. Uh, Ambassador Galadza, we are very much uh, looking forward to your perspective on this discussion we have had uh, many extraordinary voices that we've heard uh, today, uh, and we um, look to you uh, for your 
uh, for your comments uh, on the situation uh, that you are experiencing there on the ground in Ukraine as Canada's ambassador. Uh, you've been working in close partnership with the Ukrainian government. Uh, recently, Canada has deployed special forces in response to the escalating tensions. Uh, and I wonder if you could discuss with us uh, their mission as well as what Canada is doing to support uh, Ukraine at this time of crisis. How do you assess the situation? Welcome, Ambassador Galadza. Thank you very much, Ambassador Hervir. It's great to be on. Thank you for we, inviting me. We can't me. hear you. Wow. Oh, does that help? Does that help? I, I can hear you very well, so. You can? Yes. Maybe there's... Okay. Good. And hello, can you hear me now, Ambassador Revere? Okay, well, I can see that Katerina is nodding her head. So I'm just going to keep talking and hope that someone else... Is Ambassador Galadza, there's an interpretation button at the bottom of your screen. If you don't mind just clicking on that and selecting English and mute original audio, we'll be able to hear you. Unfortunately, I don't have an interpretation button more here. Okay, one sec. Okay, can you hear me now? We're still having difficulty. Okay, can you hear me now? There you go. Wonderful. I thought I had done everything. I'm very sorry. Listen, thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here and I'll tell you why. Because in working uh, on women, peace and security, the thing that we heard from women all the time was we get forgotten. When the military stuff starts happening, the women's voices get sidelined, the women's needs get sidelined. And I will admit to this august audience that it happened. It happened to me. And last week, Shortly before I got your email, Ambassador, I, it, it struck me that I had become myopic. I, my blinders had come on. I was look, reading intelligence deeply. I was uh, watching the Twitter. I was watching the open source intelligence. I was uh, working deeply on our own contingency planning. And I wasn't doing that thing that I had heard from so many women was important to do, which is to reach out and understand and make those phone calls. And soon after I got your invitation. And uh, so I, I thank you very much for that. But you know, I've just to say that someone as committed as I am gets picked up and carried uh, along and um, and and we we need the voices like like uh, like yours and and all the women on this uh, call today to to remind us uh, that we have to pay attention to this let me quickly talk about where I see the women present at the highest levels of strategy and national decision making in Ukraine and on this issue, they are not present. And that means that the messaging to Ukrainians is coming from uh, from men. And I do believe that it is directed at men. There are female, there are women ministers, yes. There are women deputy ministers. We've heard from some of them today, women ambassadors, yes. But those people setting the tone and those people who are controlling the information flow and who are doing the assessment of the situation for Ukrainians are from my perspective and where I sit, see lots of them, exclusively men. International partners, we see women. We see women uh, ministers, foreign ministers, defense ministers, ambassadors, uh, we're, we're here. Um, uh, but we are, when our focus gets turned elsewhere, that's what we're working on. At the grassroots, you've heard them today, amazing women, 
they are there, they're on top of what's going on, and they might see it even better than many of us. In the military and police, you heard from, uh, from my friend Katerina Pavlichenko, uh, they, they are there as well, but not at the decision-making tables for the military. Why am I mentioning this? Because it's not just about numbers, but when women are in those places, they diversify what they see, they diversify the assessments, but also women feel more comfortable going to other women. I see that in my own profession and I see it around me all the time. So what have I heard from the women that I've reached out to in the last, in the last few days? Um, first, that they're not getting anything from the government. They're not getting any of the information about how to prepare. You heard it from other speakers, how critical, how women, that's what women want is that practical. They want to do stuff. Uh, they want to prepare for their parents, for themselves, for their children. Um, I also heard that they are exhausted, that, that COVID, so for those of you not aware, uh, Omicron, uh, the first uh, wave, uh, the first cases were detected here mid-December, and it is hitting very, very, very hard, and it's disrupting life uh, in an in a unprecedented way. And, and speaking to someone who works with women on the front lines, uh, she said women, the, 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 the preoccupation right now is not impending conflict, it is getting through dealing with, uh, with COVID. Um, I'm hearing that uh, they would love to see diplomatic weight, all the diplomatic weight put on opening up the checkpoints. They're still closed. And that is a humanitarian uh, and human rights disaster. Uh, that they are still closed. And so, so these women uh, see all of the big, big heavy hitters uh, talking to each other about, uh, about renegotiating potentially the European security architecture, but they can't manage, nobody can manage to get those crossing points open. And that's such a priority for those communities. Um, the, uh, the practical uh, requests also for trauma, counseling, what, what people spoke about earlier, trauma education, so that they can help their kids through this. And finally, a split on weapons. Uh, women uh, on the other side of the, on the, in the, uh, according to one of my contacts from on the non-government controlled areas of, of Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts, do not like that weapons are being provided because they believe that Ukraine is preparing an offensive. On the controlled areas, they like that the women's are, weapons are being pr provided because it gives them some confidence that they will be protected. So uh, I thought that's interesting. Now about Canada, our mission here, our military mission here is a training mission. Um, uh, our, uh, uh, the, and it is being, uh, the government of Canada just announced its prolongation, its extension for three years, but also its expansion uh, uh, to include other forms of training. Uh, we've trained over 33,000 uh, uh, soldiers so far in, in a lot of the, 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 the basic individual skills, including like uh, for survivability. But in addition to that, we've also announced additional um, funding. And what I'm very pleased about sort of our MO on, on this is that we're going to try to move that funding out very quickly to the partners that we already have. And having worked with them already, they have integrated the gender lens, the women, peace and security thinking into the base structure of the projects that we have with them. And so they're ready, to, they will be ready to quickly uh, uh, plus up. Um, we have also, uh, with a number of other like-minded country, like-minded embassies here, uh, announced last week with the Ministry of Inte uh, Reintegration of the Temporarily Occupied Territories, a new fund. It's called the Partnership Fund for Resilient Ukraine. And mm -hmm. those of us supporting that fund are making a very strong emphasis that this fund needs to be people-centered. It needs to be oriented on the needs of the people to feel more stable, more secure, including, I would say, emotionally secure in the places, in the conflict affected places uh, where they live. I think uh, in December, our, our localization, WPS localization project launched with uh, the Ukrainian Women's uh, Fund and, and Natalia. Um, uh, and uh, we are, I think this is a very good time for it. I think this is a time to galvanize women and the WPS agenda in Ukraine. We've got great partners uh, to do um, 
to do that with. Uh, so we just have to, uh, people like me, just have to remember to continue doing it. And we have to make ourselves available to the people like the women you've heard on this call. And we need to take those voices to the tables where we sit and to the decisions that we can make. Well, thank you so much, Ambassador Galazza. And I'm so glad that we were able to work out the technical difficulties uh, because your words could not be more important. Uh, and it is precisely because of what you said uh, why we wanted to do this event focused on the voices of Ukraine's women, particularly at this critical juncture. Uh, so thank you for that. Thank you for so much more. And if you stay with us, and we're so pleased that Ambassador uh, Markarova could still stay with us uh, so that we can field the questions from uh, our audience. Uh, and I ask uh, my colleague, Ali, will um, go through the questions for us, but just raise your hand if you want to answer. Uh, and we will uh, now take as many as we can in the time we have. <coughs> Ali, please. Sure, two here on protection of civilians and the risk of violence. The first one asks, what do you see as the risk for civilians amid potential wide, widespread conflict? Specifically, are there concerns for mass violence and targeted killings? And the second one, what would the woman in the Donbass and along the contact line like the Ukrainian military to do regarding physical protection of individuals? Can you comment on the risk of conflict-related sexual violence, human trafficking, and increased domestic violence? Please just raise your hand if you'd like to answer. Who would like to start uh, us off on that uh, question of um, really the importance of security uh, in those specific ways? Let me start and uh, maybe my colleagues will continue. Okay. So, uh, thank you for your questions, and uh, I'm not pretending to give a full uh, reply, but um, what I would like to mention, first of all, we really need to formulate and develop in uh, uh, society wide understanding of security. Security, it's not only about uh, activity of armed forces, and security, it's not only activity of law enforcement bodies. Security, it's a responsibility of civilians. It's responsibility both of state and uh, civil society. And it's, it's really very important to put uh, in the middle of security a uh, concrete person, man or woman, uh, boy or girl, and start to rethinking our like uh, architecture of security uh, from this uh, uh, human being perspective. And uh, uh, it means that uh, when we speak about security, we speak not only about uh, absence of shooting, we speak about um, gender audit of territory, we speak about lighting, we speak about uh, transport, we speak about uh, food security, ecology, ecology, and et cetera, et cetera. So, and such uh, rethinking, it's very important for, for Ukrainian society. And Does anyone want to add to that? Thank you. If I like, if, if I could, sorry. Um, Go ahead, Alona. Actually, the Women's Information Consulting Center, when uh, such uh, troubling uh, information started to come more and more, we did develop uh, the checklist. What has about 20 different questions, some of these questions I already mentioned when I talked, it. and we send it to all our partners, we send it to different um, local authorities, we sent it to, to uh, Kiev uh, local administration, we sent to partners and asked them to send it to all uh, self-governance and local authority units to receive answers and to be ready when the situation could happen. It is one of our um, emergent answers what we would like to suggest to all our women and men, uh, boys and girls. Uh, before we uh, move to the next question, do either of the ambassadors want to weigh in here? 
Okay, we'll move on. Allie? Yeah, a specific question for Ambassador Galadza. You mentioned women are not at the high levels of decision-making um, and at the decision-making table right now in Ukraine. What do you see as the mechanisms for ensuring women get there and how can the international community support this? Thanks. Um, I don't know. It's actually something that, uh, that struck me since, since arriving here. Um, and uh, we've discussed uh, with, uh, with various ministers, including with Minister Reznikov, who's now the defense minister when he was in his previous job. And, um, and there seems, I don't want to generalize and, and I would, I, and, uh, and I, I would ask my Ukrainian colleagues to, to jump in, but for the sake of giving an answer that people can react to, there is a paternalism about, uh, about uh, women feeling uncomfortable uh, being asked to join certain of those high level uh, uh, um, tables. Um, and, and, uh, and as we all know, women sometimes need a little bit more coaxing to do something. Um, and that coaxing meeting is met with, okay, she doesn't want to do it. And so we're, we're gonna we're gonna move on. So I think that that's, that's one issue. We need to support the women uh, that are very capable of sitting at some of those tables and then uh, and, and ensure when they are asked or, 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 or orchestrate so that they are asked and, and, and provide them with the additional support. And I've seen that uh, as a phenomenon um, all over the world. Um, other than that, I mean, there's, there are very few people at those highest level decision making tables and, and there needs to be a circle of trust and, and the circle of trust here uh, still is very much sort of cut, they're all cut, cut from the same cloth. Uh, it takes a lot of courage, I think, to include people in your circle of trust who might think differently from you who might challenge you, uh, who might tell you things that you don't want to hear. But I think any of us who've studied good leadership uh, and, uh, and, and, and organizational dynamics know just how crucial that is to the success of our enterprise. And I'm not sure that that is, uh, that, that that is, that that is well understood. And, and quite frankly, I don't know how to crack that. Does anyone else want to weigh in on that? Natalia? Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to follow up on what Ambassador Galadza said um, and share our experience working with women uh, in decision making. Uh, we, uh, Ukrainian Women's Fund, we did gender monitoring of the last elections, um, uh, local elections, and the number that, um, that I mentioned during my presentation, this 36% decrease in the number of women in uh, amalgamated community councils is really a, you know, a very important message for all of us uh, to think about and to think about our strategies. We, before we had traditionally in Ukraine, more than 50% of women at the local councils, in the village councils. So what happens to these women? They are still there. They, they have experience, they have knowledge. We just need to build, as Ambassador Galadza said, these circles of trust with them. We need them in the movement. My answer is very simple. We need them in the women's movement, in the feminist movement, and we need the movement to support them so that they run for an office in the next elections. And we should start doing this now not when, you know, when the elections will start, but now, because this is a process. Okay, let's move on, Ali. Yes, two here on the defense sector. The first asking, what is the perception of women in military service in Ukraine right now, both from, when, both from women and men currently serving and civilians? And then a second question asking on how do you envision the role of women in developing strategies towards and implementing planning for the new Ukrainian total defense policy? Uh, so those two, over to you. So women in the defense sector. Let me start with some figures. And uh, I'd like to say that today we have more than 20, 32 
around 33,000 of women in the armed forces of Ukraine. And it's uh, more than 15 times more than it we had in 2008. I, I have this figure in my uh, uh, head. Uh, it was 1,800 women. So, and it is results of uh, Russian aggression, first of all, and it's a result of developing of gender equality policy, uh, destroying restrictions for women at the legal level uh, and law level to serve in the Ukrainian army. And it's also uh, really mm, like uh, visualizations of uh, um, willing of women to defend uh, own country. So, so you really had the uh, the reality of so many women volunteering after the uh, invasion uh, eight years ago, and and rectifying their participation uh, through changes in the Ministry of Defense, recognizing the critical role that women were playing, but it was not uh, really recognized in the structures. Uh, of government. Uh, so, uh, as you said, it's it's certainly one of the side effects of, of what occurred. Yes, also, yes, Milan, you're absolutely right. And also, it was necessary to change some uh, legislations in Ukraine. And it was done in cooperation with the MPs and with cooperation with civil society, with Ukrainian uh, veteran women movement, with non-governmental organizations. So, it's very uh, important process and such uh, support and such uh, uh, coordination of activity is really a very good tool for our shoulder steps. Let's uh, take one more round because that's all we have time for. Uh, Ali? Sure. Some questions from policymakers and advocates on the line asking, do you have specific recommendations for regional organizations such as the EU and the OSCE at this time? And another question, as advocates talk to U.S. policymakers and try to center your concerns and experiences, uh, what, would you what would you highlight? And then just a final question here, what are the Western and U.S. media reports getting wrong about the current crisis? Well, so what can regional organizations be doing? Uh, what are What is the West saying that does not reflect uh, perhaps what's happening there? Uh, Ambassador Galiza, let's start with you and then we'll go to Katarina uh, Levchenko. So I, I'd just like to, to share, a, share a, an observation on the Western media. They have forgotten that there are people here it has become this armchair, sit back and prognosticate. It's become this recreational activity. I would even go so far as to say by a, a, a certain uh, generation of, of people and, 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 and mostly men that, that forgets the people. They're so focused on, on the leaders. They're so focused on the geopolitical game. Um, uh, that, and sometimes the tone even is recreational. I hate to say it. Um, and, and, and that there's real dissonance because then you, you know, walk down the street. Or yesterday I stood in church looking at the faces of these people. And those faces are getting heavier every single week. Um, uh, and, and not to say that everyone knows it's about people, um, but that the message and how we talk about um, the risk of what might happen here um, misses, seems in the Western media to be missing a big piece of the picture, the, the, the people on the ground. Thank you so much for that, Katerina. Uh, thank you, Milan. Uh, I would like to raise issue about uh, like, um, in, uh, regional organizations and international organizations. You know, uh, Milan, that uh, I really support it very much and I still support the idea to have a OECE regional action plan on 1325. It's very important to put... Uh, into agenda of regional organizations, this uh, important uh, UN Security Council resolutions uh, 
instrument, tool, document, approaches, standard, etc., and uh, uh, try to develop at least sub-regional uh, plans on certain 25 because we really uh, can show that such uh, threats uh, are not only threats for Ukraine, it, they are threats for whole Europe, for whole world at all. So, and uh, for me, it uh, should be very important advocacy activity which can be done in cooperation with civil society organizations in Ukraine, where civil society is very active, in cooperation with other countries. Other countries. Thank you. You know, that's a, a really important point, and there have been efforts uh, in the OSCE to move that agenda forward, but it has not uh, uh, reached full success because consensus is required. Uh, but given the fact that it is the largest regional security organization, that has a comprehensive view of security, uh, I think you make some very important points about its necessity. Uh, Ambassador Markarova, uh, we are at the end and I wonder if you wanna give us some words uh, to sign off on uh, before we have to bring this event to conclusion. Well, thank you. I, I, I couldn't leave as you noticed because being with all of you today- We, we can't hear you. Just. Can you hear me now? Yes. Um, uh, I said, as you know, just I, I, I couldn't leave because being with all of you today has been such an ins inspiration. Uh, all of you who spoke, but especially women from Eastern Ukraine, um, they, uh, you know, you all give us a strength to not only uh, continue the fight, but actually do even more in the 24 seven regime that we are working already. Uh, but I just wanted to say, uh, just to note on this, what, what we all can do more. And especially uh, what uh, Ambassador Galadza said about the media. Like uh, when we are talking about the threat and we know the threat is real and we know the threat is there and we know the intent not to allow Ukraine to be democratic, free and independent has always been there, unfortunately. But we cannot afford to panic because this is exactly what uh, our aggressor would like us to be. He wants to demoralize us. He wants us to focus and be afraid. So we need to understand the threat and be prepared. And in this situation, I think all of our partners can really help a lot all this wide uh, projects that we do have in Ukraine. And I was really glad to hear today about the fund and other initiatives that even within the existing projects, there is possibility to redirect and refocus some of the resources and activities to actually be more demand oriented in this moment. So whatever resources and this, uh, we are asking constantly all of our colleagues and here in the US as well, that whatever resources you have on the ground, please redirect them more to this, to, to have us been more prepared, more resilient, to have to work with communities, especially the communities in the East, North, uh, to help women more, but also to inform more. I mean, if we're talking about the OECE and other organizations, we need as many eyes on the ground as possible. Because again, like we heard today about this divide on the weapons or everything else, we know the truth. The truth is Ukraine never attacked anyone. Ukraine is peaceful and Ukraine does not plan any offensive. So whatever provocations there might be, we need as many third party eyes, ears, and uh, people on the ground, uh, the easier it's going to be for all of us to first know the truth, disseminate the truth, but also stay calm. This is something we need to continue to stay reserved and stay very calm and very prepared in this situation. So if anything, I think the situation and we Ukrainians are very good at making lemonade from any lemons that we are getting. And we're getting quite a number of lemons uh, during the previous 30 years, but we have to use also in a good way this situation to, to, to build this unity. And this is what 
you know, President Zelensky spoke at, at Verkhovna Rada recently, that we have to come together regardless of how do we do our Vareniki or what Vashavankas do we wear or not wear, you know. We have to come together and we have to unite in getting ready, getting prepared, being, uh, being strong in our communities, but also signaling signaling to the aggressor what we heard, very powerful message from these women from the East, that this is our country, we do not need, we stop killing us, and we do not any of these fake uh, protections or help or whatever, just let us be who we are and let us live peacefully in our own country. So thank you, thank you again, Milan and everyone for finding time for this, getting us all together, please do it on a regular basis. Well, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Galadza and earlier Ambassador Taylor, uh, Katarina Levchenko, Minister Pavlichenko, Natalia Grabowska, and Elena Suslova, and those extraordinary women from the East uh, who we heard uh, from the front line at the front line. Um, we are indebted to all of you. We thank you for your words of wisdom, for your call to action. Um, and please, for all those who are staying with us and listening to us to this final moment, Ukraine is on the front line of the fight for freedom and democracy, for Ukraine for sure, but also for the world. Uh, this is a global, uh, a global moment uh, that we are all called to focus on and all called to do what we can because the stakes could not be higher. And to our friends in Ukraine, uh, we say that we will stand with you and particularly to the Ukrainian women who have done so much uh, despite hurdles and obstacles, uh, may you continue to be the leaders that you are uh, because your roles and your words are more important now than ever. So to each and every one of you, thank you. And to our audience, thank you. Godspeed.